Jackson. I am CEO of the Thomas Jefferson Center for Constitutional Restoration. I'm grateful for the opportunity to make a presentation to you this evening regarding the founding fathers and the issue of slavery. Since I've been affiliated with this organization, I've been blessed with the opportunity to speak about the Constitution from the viewpoint of the founders. And everywhere I go, the message is very much well received. However, there's always a but. And the but usually involves, yes, the founders were great men and we appreciate what they've done for us. And clearly we understand that the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were inspired documents that have shaped our nation. But these men owned slaves. They were hypocrites in what they believed in terms of freedom, but it didn't match up with how they lived. So what I decided to do, as my mom trained me very early in life, is to go find out for myself and do the research myself, not to rely on the information or sometimes misinformation that was taught to me in grade school. And I think many of us in this room can relate to that. And history has many, many facets to it. And the thing to do is to go back and read the original documents, to read their words, and to try to have the perspective of looking at the institution of slavery or anything that they did at that time from their point of view and not our point of view. So today I'm going to present to you all some of my findings and my research. Hopefully it will leave you enlightened and better educated than when you came here because my eyes were open when I read these books and studied these great men and I understood also that you can't get good fruit from a bad tree. And if you think that the documents that these men created are inspired, the Lord does not work through hypocrites, degenerates, and perverts to bring to pass his work. So today I'm going to present to you some things that I've found, which I think are pretty interesting, and I hope you all enjoy it. In the history of the world, nearly every nation has dealt with the issue of slavery. We've had slavery since the beginning of time. And as you find, as you look in history and have a better understanding of it, you'll understand that uh, race, excuse me, slavery is not a racial problem, it's a human problem. So I want you all, as hard as you can, try to look at this issue from the viewpoint of the founders. Put yourself back in their time and look at this issue through their lens. And I think you'll be amazed at what you see. As we know, the first settlers came to Jamestown in 1607. They came from England, they arrived in Jamestown, and they wanted religious freedom. They wanted to be able to worship God in the way that they saw fit, according to their own inspiration and not being told by the king or queen of England how and when they should worship. So in 1619, a Dutch ship shows up and it's got slaves on it. And the people who lived there at the time, now keep in mind the religious leaders, didn't want any part of it. They understood the correlation between freedom and liberty and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and this was inconsistent with that. And they said, no, we don't want them. But guess what the Brits said? No, you're going to take these slaves. And by the time when they arrived here in America, slavery was somewhat dwindling in Europe. But they wanted the vast resources of America through its products and so forth to come to Britain and the rest of Europe. So slavery was in the best interest of the British Empire. So they forced the settlers to take slave slavery. The interesting thing is, from 1619, when they arrived, to 1707, slavery became entrenched. It became a way of life. And it was more prevalent in the South because the North, North was more economically diverse, had more factories, more production in those areas. And the South was designated more farmland, and so on and so forth. So physical labor in the South was best performed by a gang system, which was usually supervised by an overseer. And free whites didn't want to do this kind of physical labor. And the Native Americans that they did recruit to do this work found it to be too hard and usually disappeared into the forest. So the African slaves that were bought over against their will were more vulnerable to enslavement. And I'll discuss that in the next slide. 
Now, when you look at the, the continent of Africa, yes, many of the peoples there look the same. However, they were diverse in terms of tribes, culture, and language. So when the slave ships would bring their slaves over, they just mixed them up. They put them in different, they tore them away from their families, away from their tribes, and away from their culture, and they put them together. And the end result of that is a demoralization process that takes place. Because you if you can imagine being stuck in a ship, and you look to your right and to your left, and there's no one there that speaks your language, no one that you recognize, no one that has your culture, and you feel isolated and alone. So by the mid-1700s, as I indicated, in terms of slavery become entrenched, they were importing approximately 7,000 slaves from Africa and the Caribbean annually. And by 1763, about 15 to 20 percent of all Americans uh, were uh, free and slave. They were of African American, African descent. And 90% of those individuals resided below the Pennsylvania line. So as slavery became entrenched, I would imagine, and this is fact, the, the American colonists began to justify having slavery. And I think if you take a look back in our own history, our most recent history, I would imagine we probably look the same way to legal immigration in terms of putting those people to work. Free labor, inexpensive labor, things have changed over time because we're, it's more prevalent and we're recognizing it now because it's been a drain on our system. But I can, assume, I can assume if you look at it from the lens of today, you probably would see legal immigration as the same thing and justify it because of the inexpensive labor that they provide. The one interesting thing that occurred in the South at the time, as you can imagine, the growth of the slaves coming to America was um, an, an exorbitant amount of people. And what begins to happen is the thought of, while wow, the more slaves we bring here, you start to think in your, in your mind, wow, what if they rise up against us? What if they take arms and go against us? Because their numbers are coming so prevalent. And at that time, you also saw a gradual emancipation of the slaves by the slave owners. Very small, but however, individuals at the time thought, you know, we need to control this. We, we have enough fears that are residing in our thinking that we want to make sure, we want to make it difficult to free your slaves. So they began passing laws that made it a great inconvenience for you to free your slaves. So in 1691, the General Assembly in Virginia passed a law aimed at making the masters think twice about freeing their slaves because any newly freed slave had to leave the colony within six months. They didn't want that slave hanging around influencing the other slaves. And the master had to pay for the trip. So you can imagine that is an inhibitor to people who feel in their heart of hearts that they want to release their slaves. In fact, one of the pieces of legislation said, no Negro, mulatto, or Indian slave shall be set free upon any pretense whatsoever except for some meritorious services to be adjudged and allowed by the governor and council for the time being. So anyone who wanted to release their slaves had to get permission from the governor and the council. And the Brits were behind this as well because they wanted to see this institution continue. And remember, in Virginia, they controlled the House of Lords. The House of Commons represented the people, and the House of Lords represented the crown. So passing this legislation was paramount. In fact, George Mason said, this infernal traffic originated in the avarice of British merchants. The British government constantly checked the attempts of Virginia to put a stop to it. Every master of slaves is born a petty tyrant. They bring the judgment of heaven on our country. As nations cannot be rewarded or punished in the next world, they must be in this. By an inevitable chain of causes and effects, providence punishes national sins by national calamities. The Civil War. He lamented that some of our Eastern brethren had from a lust of gain embarked in this nefarious traffic as to the states being in possession of the right to import. This was the case with many other rights now to be properly given up. He held it essential in every point of view that the general government should have power to prevent the increase of slavery. Highlighting again the fact that they didn't want slaves in the beginning, but the British 
said, no, you will have slavery. But here we are, we're getting towards the American Revolution of 1774 and attitudes are changing. How can we want freedom from the British crown and we have slaves ourselves? Because we feel like we're slaves to the British crowns. Taxation without representation and so forth. So the attitude in the North and South began to change in 1774. And there were official actions towards the abolition of this institution. So when the Constitutional Convention got together in 1787, the sentiment for phasing out the entire institution of slavery was becoming very strong. In fact, along with the Congress at the time, in 1787, they passed the Northwest Ordinance. The people at the time wanted to ensure that in the Ohio Valley, a lot of people were settling there, and they knew in, in some due time that that area would become divided up into states. And they wanted each of those areas to come in on equal footing as the other 13 colonies. So they passed this Northwest Ordinance before the Constitutional Convention began and then after the Constitutional Convention was completed. And they wanted three things taught in the uh, schools. They wanted religion, morality, and knowledge taught in the schools because they understood that this democratic republic would not be successful if the people were not moral, if they didn't have morals, if religion was not part of making the government great and strong. And one of the votes that they had and one of the pieces of legislation in this ordinance was the fact that there would be no slavery in that area whatsoever. So that was part of the Northwest Ordinance. And there was only one vote against that, and that was the delegate from New York. Probably was some descendant of uh, Mayor Bloomberg. But anyway, <laughs> in nearly all the states at that time, the moral issue was clear as eight states proceeded to abolish slavery either gradually or immediately. And the first state to do that in their constitution was Vermont in 1777. And then Northern reformers began passing these emancipation manumission acts in the late 1700s, and then the Quaker Anti-Slavery Society Group of 1775 was formed. In fact, Benjamin Franklin became president of this later. So by 1830, there were only 3,000 slaves left in the North compared to more than 2 million in the South. 2 million slaves in the South in 1830. And the interesting thing, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, but the pathway to an economic transition out of slavery was in question because many of these slaves were incapable of taking care of themselves. So keep that thought in the back of your mind as we go through this presentation. John Jay. John Jay was the first, just, su su the first Supreme Court justice. And he said, prior to the Great Revolution, our people had been so long accustomed to the practice and convenience of having slaves that very few among them even doubted the propriety and rectitude of it. Some liberal and conscientious men had indeed, by their conduct and writings, drawn the lawfulness of slavery into question. Their doctrines prevailed by almost insensible degrees and was like the little lump of leaven which was put into three measures of meal. So he's highlighting here the change in the thoughts of the people regarding this institution. So let's talk a little bit about slavery in the North and the South. So in 1780, the northern states, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, 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 Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey began to adopt gradual emancipation laws. But however, far more slaves were freed in the south than in the north. And most of that was done by private manumission, even regard regardless of the legislation that was on the books. You still, you still saw a gradual freeing of the slaves in the south more so than in the north. So by 1810, there were 78,000 freed blacks in the north, but 108,000 free blacks in the south. Here's a very interesting point that I want you all to take special note of. So you've got this institution of slavery, and the sentiment in the colonies is it's got to go away. It's got to go away. We're going to talk a little about that later as they recognize it in the Constitution itself. But in 1793, a fellow by the name of Eli Whitney makes a monumental invention. And he invented the cotton gin. Before the cotton gin, when you plucked cotton, cotton ball has seeds in it. And each slave would take manually take that cotton and pick out each seed. Long, laborious 
process. And it became, at that time, real expensive to actually have a slave because the return on investment was not that high. You had to feed the slave, you had to provide health care, housing, clothing, and so forth. And the rate of return on the products they were selling, the margins were very small until the cotton gin was invented because the South then began to produce over 70% of the world's cotton using this machine. And the price dropped from a high of a dollar a pound to just a few cents. So then you feel in your mind that we've got to have more slaves, more slaves, more slaves, more fields, more cotton to pick. And then the institution of slavery just took off. In fact, by the Civil War, there were four million slaves in the uh, colonies at that time. So jumped from two million to four million, thanks to Eli Whitney. So that's a picture of my little boy Alvin. I don't know where Alvin is here. I think he's probably somewhere reading scriptures and doing something, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> there we are in Constitution Hall, and we're gonna talk about the Constitutional Convention. And one of the interesting thing is, when you talk to people, they, they, their first inclination is to say that every man that was at the Constitutional Convention owned slaves. And during the research, we find out that only 12 of the 55 delegates had slavers, had slaves. 12 of the 55. Franklin had two, which is a surprise to most. He had two slaves. Uh, Washington owned 123, but he had 316 working on his plantation. And Madison and uh, George Mason had about 106 slaves each. Jefferson. The reason I'm highlighting Jefferson is because he is picked on quite a bit in terms of this issue of slavery and the fact that he wrote the Declaration of Independence and had a lot to do with the Constitution that we're living by today. But a thorough study of Thomas Jefferson reveals that he was a man who abhorred slavery. And it's all throughout his writings and even some of his actions, which we're going to talk about here, that he sponsored legislation after legislation to remove the institution of slavery. He was an active, actively engaged in the cause of abolition of this, of this institution. So in 1779, he proposed legislation that would have provided for the gradual emancipation in Virginia. In 1784, he proposed a law that came within one vote of adoption that it would have banned slavery from the entire Western territories of the US. And in 1787, he published his notes on the state of Virginia which contained the most eloquent denunciation of slavery written by anyone in the founding area. And if you read his books and his writings and words and so forth, you come to the realization that he was a good man. He did have slaves, he inherited his slaves, and they loved him because he was kind to them. He treated them as men and women. But remember, we're looking at this from, the from their eyes as we go through this. And we'll talk a little bit more about that so in the draft of the Constitution for Virginia, he provided that all the slaves would be emancipated in the state by 1800. And in any child born in Virginia after 1801 would be born free. In 1807, as President Jefferson, he called for the abolition of the importation of slaves. And throughout his life, he expressed opposition to slavery in numerous private letters. In fact, in the original version of the Declaration of Independence, these words were in there. He says, he, the king of Britain, has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty and the persons of distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, determined to keep an open market where men should be brought and sold. He has prostituted this, his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or to restrain this commerce. Didn't make it into the final version of the Declaration of Independence, but these are one of the grievances that Jefferson listed. Benjamin Franklin, he was allowed to evolve regarding slavery and understood history and understood that the Brits forced slavery on the colonists. And when he got back in 1785, he became president of the Quaker Anti-Slavery Society and came to the conclusion that the two slaves that he had working for him, he had to set free, which he did. So let's talk about the founding fathers and slavery. And you know, we cannot escape the perception or the reality of the perception of how the white man viewed slaves, black people at that time. 
And just consider the conditions that they were in, <coughs> not favorable conditions to really rise and be compared to your peers. So they looked at blacks as being inferior and being unable, unable to be educated. And the founders opposed their massive immigration in society for reasons we're going to discuss later. But they actually, the sentiment among the founders was, we're going to deport the slaves. We're going to gradually free them, but then we're going to put them on a ship and send them back to Africa. Or worse, Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> the founders also recognized that a large influx of immigrants could possibly change the attitudes of people learning how to be free. Isn't that interesting? In fact, Madison and Jefferson felt, as this preacher indicated, he says, feeling and knowing that their owners regard and treat them as property only, the slaves are inclined to lose sight of their better character and higher interests, and in their ignorance and depravity to estimate themselves and religion and virtue no higher than their owners do. So in those conditions, you probably don't have a good sense of who you are as an individual. So then you're going to behave beneath your capacity, your God-given blessings and capacity. One of the things that I've just jumped out at me when I started my research is this quote from Jefferson, because he had the same thoughts as the other founders and actually America as a whole then. He says, be assured that no person living wishes more sincerely than I do to see a complete refutation of the doubts I have myself entertained and expressed on the grade of understanding allotted to them by nature, and to find that in this respect they are on par with ourselves. My doubts were the result of personal observation on the limited sphere of my own state where the opportunities for the development of their genius were not favorable, and those of exercising it still less so. I express then, therefore, with great hesitation, but whatever be their degree of talent, it is no measure of their rights, no measure of their rights. He saw them as human beings. Because Sir Isaac Newton has, was superior to others in understanding and intellect, he was not, therefore, lord of the person or property of others. Going back to the feeling of the day, this statistic came out. It said New York Negroes constituted one thirty-fifth of the population but contributed to one-fourth of the state's convicts, and Pennsylvania Negroes made up one thirty-fourth of the population, but supplied one-third of all prisoners. When you don't know who you are, when you're operating beneath your capacity, you behave that way. Franklin's change of heart occurred after visiting a school where he's exposed to black children. He says, I was on the whole much pleased and from what I then saw, have conceived higher capacities of the black race than I had ever before entertained. Their comprehension sees as quick, their memory as strong, and their docility in every respect equal to that of white children. The plan was to instruct, to advise, to qualify those who have been restored to freedom for the exercise and enjoyment of civil liberty, to promote in them habits of industry, to furnish them employment suited to their age, sex, talents, and other circumstances, which we conceive will essentially promote the public good and the happiness of those hitherto much neglected fellow creatures. Did you all read that quote in school? No. Absolutely not. So let's talk about the Constitution, the original Constitution, and the issue of slavery. So. The Constitution, and we've heard this before, constituted three-fifths of the slaves towards population in terms of representation in Congress. The anti-founding fathers say, quote, each slave was counted as three-fifths of a person. The problem of race relations in America has always revolved around the question whether non-whites are or are not to be treated as complete persons as the equals of whites. They're only three-fifths of a person. We've heard that quite a bit. But we know through our own research that the clause was not a measurement of human worth. It was an anti-slave provision to limit the political power of the South. So by including only three-fifths of the total number of slaves in congressional calculations, you're able to limit the representation from the South. Because half the population in South Carolina was slave, and in Georgia, 40% of the population. 
This provision only related to slaves. Keep in mind that not all black people, because those who were free at the time could vote based on the individual state. They were not included in these calculations, only the slaves. Governor Morris said, who was one of the most outspoken critics of slavery, attacked that three-fifths clause when he said, are they admitted as citizens? Then why are they not admitted on equality with white citizens? Are they admitted as property? Then why is not other property admitted to the computation? Mr. Jerry from Massachusetts said he wanted to know why New Englanders could not be allowed to count their cattle if Georgians could count their slaves. This was a debate that went back and forth about that contentious three-fifths provision. So let's take a look at the Constitution itself in terms of is it pro-slavery or is it not. Article 1, Section 8 gives the states the authorization, the states give the authorized to the federal government that they can suppress slave rebellions. Article 1, Section 9, the slave trade clause. clause. This provision gave the, state, the states the right to continue importing slaves for an additional 20 years from the date of the enactment of the Constitution. Article 4, Section 2, the Fugitive Slave Clause. This provision gave each state the right to demand the return of any person charged with a criminal act within its jurisdiction which was used by pro-slavery South to have their slave property returned to them. This clause legally obligated all citizens, no matter where they were, to assist in the return of runaways. This provision is in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 9. Very interesting. Now, we, looked, we talked about how the pro-slavery advocates looked at Article 1, Section 9. You mean you're giving the South 20 more years to import slaves? Well, during the debate at the Constitutional Convention, the sentiment was clear in the room. We, we're going to abolish slavery. We have to do it. The question is how. How are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? There's two million of them. How are we going to integrate them in society or, better yet, deport them to Africa? How are we going to do this? Because the, the question is clear. So the North, you know, the North is advocating the abolition of slavery. But then you had three states, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, that says, wait a minute, we can't do that. Brethren, we cannot do that because a lot of our slaves are mortgaged to the banks in Europe. And if you free the slaves now, you will bring an economic calamity on the South that will cripple us. So then the North said, OK, we'll give you 20 years. We'll give you 20 years to find a new way of labor. And that was agreed upon in the Constitution. That was a compromise. C.C. C. Pickney, who was there, said, declared it to be his firm opinion that if himself and all his colleagues were to sign the Constitution and use their personal influence, it would be of no avail towards obtaining the assent of their constituents. South Carolina and Georgia cannot do without their slaves. And this was a trading chip that the North used against the South when it came to regulating commerce. James Madison. It were doubtless to be wished that the power of prohibiting the importation of slaves had not been postponed until the year 1808, or rather than it had been suffered to have immediate operation. But it is not difficult to account either for this restriction on the general government or for the manner in which the whole clause is expressed. It ought to be considered as a great point gained in favor of humanity that a period of 20 years may terminate forever within these states a traffic which has so long and so loudly abraded the barbarism of modern policy that within that period it will receive a considerable discouragement from the federal government and may be totally abolished. These are the notes of James Madison, the architect of the Constitution. So when you look at the Fugitive Slave Clause, you can't escape the reality of the perceptions of the black man during that time period, as evident in this slide here that we're going to go through. The Fugitive Slave Clause, as I indicated before, was seen as a pro-slavery provision. However, it's an example of the fact that the Founding Fathers recognized that slavery existed and that it would eventually die if they could contain it. So therefore, the wording in the document is critical, and that's what we're going to talk about here. So the language of the Fugitive, fugitive Slave Clause indicates now, listen carefully. No person 
held in service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor may be due. Notice that the words slave and slavery are carefully avoided because Madison wrote, he thought it wrong to admit in the Constitution the idea that there should be property in men. So even though they recognize that this clause was pro-slavery and helpful to the South, they were very careful in how they worded it. They didn't use the word slave or slavery, and they referred to these individuals as persons. And that's very key as we move along. So there were some major reasons for not freeing the slaves. So keep in mind, we want to look through the lens of the people that lived at that time as we go through these. So immediate freedom for the minority would have ended freedom for the majority, for, as we discussed earlier. Two million slaves, the founders are trying to teach liberty and freedom to a people who will have to learn how to do that in an influx of folks who don't have those ideals at that time would have created some chaos. The pathway to economic tr transition out of slavery was not clear because slaves were seen and most of them couldn't take care of themselves. Had there been no union of the 13 colonies, the South would have been free to develop slavery without res restraint because the framers were highly focused on republic building. And they thought and they acted on the assumption that the union was the highest good and that ultimately all problems, including slavery, would be resolved if they could only keep the country together long enough to fix it. They recognized that it was there, but keeping the union together was paramount. So let's talk about and summarize the Constitution and slavery. The Constitution protected slavery but did not stand in the way of any state that wanted to abolish it. Congress could cut off the slave trade after 20 years. Congress could regulate interstate commerce on slaves and slaves were regarded as men in the document. Remember, men and persons are in the document, not the word slave and slavery. Frederick Douglass, one of my favorite, most favorite people in history, he's an, an example to me of how one man can make a difference. Think back to what we talked about earlier, the perception of white people towards black people was not very favorable. They can't be educated. Some regard their animals. They can't take care of themselves. They're, they can't be educated. They can't read and write. And then comes Frederick Douglass, my man, Frederick Douglass. We need to do more to honor and revere him. He should have a monument in Washington, D.C. And when I'm elected to Congress, I'm going to take care of that. <laughs> so Frederick was born in Maryland as a slave on February 14, 1818. Now, that's an interesting fact there because we really don't know what day Frederick was born. However, he remembers his mom referring to him as his Valentine. Now, Frederick was taken from his mom at an early age for obvious reasons. You don't want that affection between a child and their mother, particularly when you have slaves. You want them separated. So the mom was sold to a nearby farm eight to ten miles away. And Frederick only remembers four or five times in his life where he was exposed to her. And it was usually in the middle of the night and for short periods of time because she would finish her work during the day and then she would walk the eight to ten miles in the, in the evening to go lay down with Frederick in his room wherever he slept on the floor or what have you. And she would hold him and she would whisper into his ear, my little Valentine. And he remembers that. And he only remembers that exposure for four or five times in his life. And then mom would get him off to sleep and then walk the eight to 10 miles back to the plantation that she left. Because if she didn't make it back there in time, the punishment was usually a beating. So that's Frederick's relationship with his mom. Now, his father is unknown, but because of Frederick's complexion, they assume that his father was the master of the house. So at age eight, he was sent to Baltimore to be a houseboy. And there he was introduced to reading. The mother of the home had sympathy and compassion on Frederick, so she began to teach him how to read along with her other children until the master of the house got wind of it and told her not to do it. He forbade her from teaching him. She said, you can't teach the slave to read because he might read freedom and want it for himself. You will ruin him if you exposed him to reading. So you are forbidden to do so. 
Little Frederick's in the other room and he hears this and he realizes that education and knowledge is his path to freedom. The truth will set you free. And Frederick did whatever he could to learn how to read. And how he did it was interesting. He, because he was in the house, he would go in the cupboard and he would take pieces of bread. And then he would go out and play with the neighbor kids, usually the white poor kids, because they, of course, he would feed them bread in exchange for them teaching him the ABC. And that's how Frederick began to learn how to read. Those white kids would teach him how to read in exchange for bread. And he began reading the scriptures. He began reading magazines, newspapers, whatever he could do to bring upon himself that power and that knowledge. And in 1838, he escaped to freedom. Frederick Douglass, interestingly enough, was looked at the Constitution as a pro-slavery pro -slavery document. In fact, he said, I now hold, as I have ever done, that the original intent and meaning of the Constitution makes it a pro-slavery instrument, which I cannot bring myself to vote under or swear to support. And this is what he learned from the other abolitionists that he was in company with. They taught him these things. He took that for granted. So Frederick moved away from them to Rochester, New York, and began his development of intellectual independence because he began to do the research and study himself. And he had a change of heart. In fact, on July 4th, he gave a speech to commemorate American independence. A black man, a free black man, with all his people in bondage, was asked to speak on the 4th of July. And there he drew a contrast between the nation's founding ideals and the moral outrage of slavery. Instead of being the honest men I have before declared them to be, were great impostors. If the Constitution was never intended to include black people within the document's legal protections, to interpret the Constitution as supporting slavery is to perpetuate a slander upon the memory of the framers. So he came to the conclusion that if the Constitution supported slavery, then getting rid of it would be illegal and deemed unconstitutional. Therefore, reading the, the document as anti-slavery enhanced the constitutional case to get rid of it. Douglas would advocate that the Constitution is a justification for eliminating this awful institution. Douglas revered the Constitution as the slave's best hope for liberty. And he came to believe that natural law justified a moral, aspirational reading of the Constitution. And even if the founders intended that document to be pro-slavery, they had no right to do so, because slavery violates human rights under God-given natural law. And he also understand the importance of keeping the Union together, because if the South were free from the North, they could perpetuate slavery indefinitely. Frederick Douglass was a great man. So the Constitution had established the institutional framework to implement the natural rights proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence. So there's Frederick, armed with an ethical reading of the Constitution. He began to seek and demonstrate that slavery was not only immoral, but also unconstitutional according to that great document. In fact, his vision of the Constitution was used as a weapon later by Dr. Martin Luther King and other leaders of the NAACP. So this is what Frederick would say to the abolitionists. Do you not realize that in condemning the Constitution, you are forsaking a vital legal weapon against slavery? To the Southern slaveholders, he would argue, do you not realize that slavery violates the Republican ideas of the founders? Do you not realize that the Constitution authorized the federal government to abolish slavery, slavery not merely in its branches, in the territories, but also at its roots, which is the southern states? Dr. Martin Luther King, the March on Washington, said this 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languishing in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. So we have come here today to dramatize a shameful condition, 
In a sense, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects, this is the key words here, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So let's transition to some of the falsehoods that we're hearing today. The founders never really believed that all men were created equal, that the Constitution's compromise with the slave interests are sometimes said to be so wicked that the Constitution deserves little or no respect. The founders, in their infinite wisdom, didn't even fail, failed to abolish slavery, and that the Constitution is a pro-slavery document. And I hear this last bullet all the time. Uh, you're telling me that Thomas Jefferson and George Washington were advocates for the abolition of slavery, but they had slaves themselves. What's up with that? Not, that's not consistent. So when we look at some of the practices used to defame the founders, we've got one called deconstructionalism which is a steady flow of belittling and negative portrayals of Western heroes, beliefs, values, and institutions. This is where you identify every wart and exploit it versus highlighting what has made the Amer United States of America as the envy of the world. This is what you're seeing today. Post-structuralism, a belief that nothing transcendent can be learned from history where they change the meaning of words, e pluribus unum, out of many, one, which recognizes diversity in America, but a common national unity, which overcomes differences. E pluribus unum today means things a little different, out of one, many, dividing the nation into separate groups with no unifying commonality. Then you've got modernism examining historical events and persons through the lens of today. And there you produce many flawed conclusions. When you look at Jefferson, when you look at religions of the day and how re some religions have progressed, you assume that those religions have been that way forever. And you look at the founding fathers and the institution of slavery. You look at it from today's lens, not from their point of view. Minimalism, you take a complex person like Thomas Jefferson who a, was a complex, sophisticated man, and you portray him as a racist, atheist, and et cetera, you narrow him down to a single issue to fit into your agenda. That's what you're called a minimalist when you do that. And then here's my favorite, academic collectivism. Instead of going to the original documents, they rely on their peers. They quote their peers. And this is dominating the academic world today. They're not using the primary source documents and historical, evi historical evidence those are the proper standards for historical truth, not a professor's opinion. So they're feeding off one another, they're quoting each other as opposed to going to the original documents. And this is what we're finding in our recent tech, in our most modern textbooks. Most of the time, historians intentionally omit critical pieces of evidence, which we're highlighting today. None of the things that I'm learning, that I'm teaching you all today, I learned in school. Some writers, not content with attacking the Constitution, for its actual compromise with slavery make up provisions that are not there. For example, the Constitution denied blacks the right to vote. That is incorrect. Free blacks could vote per the state that they lived in. And here's a common thing that you hear, whereas early the Declaration of Independence had so eloquently proclaimed that all men are created equal, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention put political expediency before the immorality of slavery. They couldn't even abolish this institution. Justice Thurgood Marshall, we're using their own words, said in 1987, quote, nor do I find the wisdom, foresight, and sense of justice exhibited by the framers particularly profound. To the contrary, the government they devised was defective from the start. He also said the prevailing opinion of our framers was that blacks were so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. And he's speaking large following Thurgood Marshall. But these are the things that he's saying, and people are believing this because they're not bothering to go do the research themselves. Ralph Abernathy, 
There can be no pure memory of an American Revolution that published a declaration that liberty was a right accorded to all men and then created a constitution that specifically prohibited blacks from enjoying that right. The only logical conclusion that modern blacks can draw from such circumstances is that their forefathers were not regarded as men by the white founders of this country. So how do we counter some of those age-old arguments? With facts instead of emotion. Most of the founders knew the practice of slavery was at war with the principles of liberty. There's no mention of the word slave or slavery in those two documents. The Constitution is based on God-given natural law. And Jefferson referred to all men, even blacks, in the Declaration of Independence as men. Madison wrote that it thought it to be wrong to admit in the Constitution that the idea that there could be property in men. They understood it existed, and they acknowledged it, but they had to contain it so it eventually would go away. So the founders have failed to abolish slavery. Why is that? They understood that immediate freedom for the minority would have ended freedom for the majority for the reasons we stated earlier. The prejudices that were there, the sheer numbers of people, and they're trying to establish a new government, and they were highly focused on republic building. We've got to build the union first. And then the issue of slavery, hopefully, and other problems will take care of themselves. Because there had been no union to 13 colonies, the South would have been free to develop slavery without restraint. The three-fifths clause, this clause was not a measurement of human worth, rather, rather it was an anti-slave provision to limit the political power of proponent slavery. This was a compromise. And it's interesting today, when we talk to political leaders and we, we listen to them, they love to compare themselves to the founding fathers in terms of the ability and desire to compromise giving in to your values, to compromise with the other side of the aisle, to get legislation done for the good of the country. What they don't understand in 1787, these men went through four months of getting after it, hashing it out, because their ultimate goal was general consensus or general agreement. That's what they wanted. They talked it out. They approached it with the premise of we're going to be problem solvers. We're going to come up with solutions. We're going to be, we're going to be part of the solution, not the problem. So there's only three compromises in the Constitution. Only three, slavery, commerce, and proportionate representation. Those are only the only three areas of compromise in the Constitution. So by including only three-fifths of the total number of slaves in congressional calculations, the North was able to inhibit the ability for the South to amass several numbers in the Congress. Article 1, Section 9. Until after 1800, the South was favorable to the movement of limited slavery. What happened in 1793 that changed all that? The invention of the cotton gin, correct. The delay of 20 years was the price 10 states were willing to pay in order to keep Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina in the Union. And again, we had the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. The Ohio Valley, that eventually will become into the Union as states, no slavery. No slavery in those, those areas whatsoever. So why did some of the founders, such as Washington and Jefferson, continue to have slaves through the founding area? Washington freed his slaves, all of them, most of them, in his will. Why didn't Jefferson? Well, in 1799, Virginia law allowed for the freeing of slaves at death. George Washington was able to do that. In 1826, the law changed. No Negro or mulatto slave shall be set free unless the emancipator pays for his transportation out of the country within six months. And Thomas Jefferson wanted to do this. And he freed some of his slaves, but he was already broke. So he didn't have the money to do so. We are all human. A family that freed its slaves was likely to endanger their own livelihood. Jefferson said, we have the wolf by the ears, and we can neither hold him nor safely, safely let him go. Justice is in one scale, and self-preservation in the other. Jefferson also said, deep-rooted prejudice entertained by the whites, 10,000 recollections by the blacks of the injuries they have sustained, new provocations, the real distinctions which nature has made, and many other circumstances will divide us into parties, race wars, and produce convulsions which will probably never end but in the extermination of 
of the one or the other race. Jefferson and others also recognized that many of the slaves couldn't take care of themselves. In fact, he said to give liberty to, or rather to abandon persons whose habits have been formed in slavery is like abandoning a child. In fact, George Washington, when he freed his slaves, he didn't free the older ones because they, they couldn't take care of themselves. So he made provisions for them to take care of them until they died, but he freed the rest of his slaves. So let's summarize. 1619, the first slaves arrived. The British government, contrary to what the settlers indicated, said, no, you're going to have slaveries. slavery. So between 1619 and 1707, it became entrenched. However, in 1774, during the founding era, attitudes changed. A change of heart came among the people. Throughout history and down in the South, more of the slaves were freed in the South than in the North. All men are created equal, and there's no mention of the word slave or slavery in the Constitution of the Declaration of Independence. Had there been no union of the 13 colonies, and we've said this ad nauseum, but the South would have been free to continue to develop slavery. And the founders were highly focused on republic building, keeping the union together. And we know that most slaves were not able to take care of themselves. And my man, Frederick Douglass, I've got to read this quote again. Instead of being the honest men I had before declared them to be, were great impostors, if the Constitution was never intended to include black people within the document's legal protections, to interpret the Constitution as supporting slavery is to perpetuate a slander upon the memory of the framers. And our concluding slide. Abraham Lincoln said this, and this is a great summary of the issue in terms of what he faced. He said, quote, the fathers of this government expected and intended the institution of slavery to come to an end. They expected and intended that it should be in the course of ultimate extinction. It is not true that our fathers made this government part slave and part free. They found the institution existing among us and they left it as they found it. But in making the government, they left this institution with many clear marks of disappropriate probation upon it. They found slavery among them and they left it among them because of the difficulty, the absolute possibility, impossibility of its immediate removal. These are words from Abraham Lincoln. We've heard words from Frederick Douglass, Thomas Jefferson, George Mason, James Madison, We've done the research, we've gone back and looked in their words, and we've looked at this institution of slavery from their eyes, and hopefully we've all become enlightened today that we're able to arm ourselves with a sophisticated argument against people who attack you emotionally on this issue, and knowledge is freedom, just like with Frederick Douglass. He understood that if he could learn to read, that was his road to liberty and to freedom. And what does the truth do? The truth sets you free. So I want to thank you all for enduring this, and I appreciate your attention. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Marshall and Ralph, Ab Ralph Abernathy until two and a half years ago when I met Glenn Kimber. And he introduced me to uh, the making of America and to the Constitution from the viewpoint of the founders. So education. 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 Yes, ma'am. I wanted to comment on what you said about slavery being a human problem, not a race. Right. Um, a friend of mine's daughter went to a Christian conference and they were told that now slavery is more common than Now. It's not a race problem, is it? Right. Monty, do you have anything you want to add? Never mind. I've got a question okay. for you. Come on, wave it, wave it. Go ahead. On one of your slides, you mentioned about how the slaves in the area were about 134th or something like that. Yes. They had to do one third in jail. Right. It's like 21, maybe. We see that, we hear that quote a lot now about how we talk about blacks in prison right now and then yet uh, they only make about 10% of the population. Right. Do you see a correlation there somehow? Yes, because uh, Frederick Douglass was separated from his mom 
early after he was born. And the individuals that are in prison now usually came from, usually no dad in the home, usually raised by their grandmother, or maybe their mom who've got some issues, and they're not high school, they don't have high school degrees, they're not educated. So the disintegration of the family and being uneducated, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. That's a recipe for, I don't know who I am. I have no other way out, so I'm going to rob and steal and plunder to make my way. Because I don't have what other people have. I mean, a two-parent household gives you a better chance to compete, and an education gives you an even better chance to compete. Did I answer that question okay, Monty? Thank you. Pete. In, in all of your research, this, this question kept getting me through your presentation. Didn't our founders do what they had to do to preserve the Union and not have the Hitler or the war, Revolutionary War a wasted effort? That's correct. They had Did to they keep the, say that? Yeah, they had to keep the Union together, Pete, keep the North and the South together. And if they could build a republic and build it based on a moral, religious foundation, because the sentiment was, Slavery is not consistent with what we want in terms of liberty and freedom. And if they could contain it, if they could keep the Union together and contain it in the South, don't let it allow it to spread, stop the importation of it in 20 years, then it eventually would die out. But then you had good old Eli Whitney that came along, and then greed and avarice took over. But Eli Whitney and the Benson of the cotton gin did not mean for it to do what you're saying it did. I don't think that was his intention. Of well, I, I, I don't know. I, you, Glenn, you were there. You, did you know? You knew Eli. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 there we go. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been an un, unintended concept? I, I think so. I mean, I, I don't know what's in, what was in Brother Whitney. I, I, I assume he didn't invent this with the premise of, I'm, we're going to keep slavery and trenched here by this. I don't think that drove his, uh, his motivation. Uh oh. Yes, Julie. Can you tell us the story of the Taste of Oh, Thomas, Al that's right. That's a great story. But anyway, that, that's an interesting story because Mr. Callender went to Secretary of State James Madison and the President and said, uh, I want to be Postmaster General down in Richmond. And Jefferson and Madison told him, Sir, I appreciate your willingness to serve, but you're not qualified that, for that position. So Mr. Callender, he said, okay, we'll see about that, buddy. So he began to become, began to develop hatred inside of him against Jefferson. So he began to write articles accusing Jefferson of fathering a bunch of slaves on his plantation. He never bothered to go to the plantation himself, but he heard about these mulatto kids that were running around on the plantation and assumed that Jefferson was the father and wrote these scurrilous things about Jefferson. Jefferson responded by saying, he said, you know, the people that know me know what kind of individual that I am. And my enemies, they're not going to believe me anyway. And I'm in the business of running this country, so I'm not going to deal with it. But then you've had the Federalists and the Republicans at that time. The Federalists took that information. They wrote articles about it. And it carried on and continued. And it was picked up today. So then during the time of William Jefferson Clinton, our president in dealing with Monica Lewinsky, the issue came out, guess what? Thomas Jefferson fathered some slaves with Sally Hemming. William Jefferson Clinton, they all have flaws, even the great Thomas Jefferson. So that information was released. Come to find out later on, it was erroneous. It was incorrect. Incorrect. Nothing but lies against Jefferson. And I could read some quotes that accentuate that, but that's what I found in my research. I talked about the DNA, didn't I? Well, the DNA, the DNA proved, however, that there was a Jefferson that fathered those kids, and we assume it was his, either his brother or his cousin, or one of his nephews. A nephew, yeah, okay. Right, a family member, right. I was yeah. just going to say it was his nephew, and the only way that they, you can track the DNA is through the Y chromosome, and Thomas Jefferson didn't have any sons. Well, he had one, but he That's died right. when he was Baby. That's so right. So they really no way to prove exactly. Oh. Yeah, it's interesting. We're in Monticello, and we're in Jefferson's bedroom, and the young lady who's doing the tour 
Besides, at that point, to bring up the fact that Jefferson fathered children with, with Sally Hemming, right there in his bedroom. And then in the, when you go down into the library there where they, they sell you stuff, there's a book right there that refutes everything that she said. And I, I thank Jeline for grabbing me because I was about to leap over the people and give her one of these a forearm shiver because she was wrong. But that's that's what they perpetuate. That's what they want us to see because if, if we can minimalize Jefferson, if we can attack the personality, that minimizes the doctrine. Right? Exactly. Okay. Any other questions? Mary Alice, do you have anything? You want to play something else? Okay, great, great. Hey, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. You can, you can say, you can, you can.